On this episode of Business World, we take a closer look at the Versace mansion. Oddly enough, fashion designer Gianni Versace wasn't looking for a home when he purchased Casa Casarina in 1992. The late designer discovered the estate by chance during a quick visit to Miami to visit his sister Donatella on his way to Cuba. In 2001, Donatella revealed to the New York Times how her brother came to own the Versace mansion. We took a walk in South Beach and Johnny just stopped in front of the building and said, I want this house, just like that, I want this house. But it wasn't a house, it was literally an apartment building and people were living in it. The apartment complex passed through a number of owners until Versace laid eyes on it in 1992 and transformed it into one of the country's grandest mansions. Along with the initial costs, Versace invested an additional $32 million into renovations over the course of three years. He turned what was once a 24 apartment complex into a grand estate the world will come to know as the Versace Mansion. Complete with 12 suites, Versace removed the elevator, replaced the fountain, and reconstructed the observatory, another one of Versace's many aesthetic accomplishments. After Versace's murder, the house sat empty for three years before Donatella sold it. After passing through the hands of two new owners, the mansion sold at auction for $41 million and is now operated by Victor Hotels Management as the Villa Casa Casarina. Now, guests can host events and weddings at the Versace Mansion, spend the night, and dine in at the hotel's restaurant, appropriately named Johnny's. Thank you for watching MDC TV. We'll be right back. Friends, welcome back to Business World. Today we're talking about the Versace Mansion. And with us today, we have a special guest. We have attorney Dos Santos. Ms. Dos Santos, thank you for coming to Business World. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. It's your first time here. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your law practice? Well, I own, I'm the president of Dos Santos Law PA. We're located in Westchester, right here in Miami. Wonderful. 7480 Bird Road. Um, I practice mostly personal injury and insurance litigation been around about 12 years now. Excellent. That's yes. wonderful. That's wonderful. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so it's your first time here. Um, as you know, a lot of our students uh, are interested in the law. Um, can you tell us a little bit about maybe what inspired you into becoming a lawyer? Well, statistically, less than 10% of Latinos in general, especially Lat Latino women, yeah. hold postgraduate degrees. And, you know, being that I was raised in Westchester and, and in the community, I did see a representation of that. Um, and in school, I, I decided I, I wanted to, you know, maybe break that mold and, um, and serve my community as well, which is primarily what inspired me to continue and go to law school. That's awesome. I mean, what, what, what school did you go to? Like, you went locally here in high school, and you went locally at college here, or did you go away to college? Or? Well, um, a little bit of both. So locally, you know, I am an MDC student. I'm yeah. <laughs> alum. <laughs> Yay. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 right. I graduated high school in Westchester. Okay. I uh, went to Miami-Dade for a little while, and then Nova Southeastern University, and then for law school, I went to Ave Maria School of Law in Naples. Nice. So you did your bachelor's at Nova Southeastern. Right. What yes. was your What was your major? My major was, uh, funny enough, um, feminism. <laughs> feminism, really? Yes, it was a thing. <laughs> wow. Well, was that was that first generation feminism, second generation, or third generation, or all the above? Who knows anymore? Who knows anymore? You know? <laughs> right? it's, it's more. It's more so so much. Yeah. yeah, but ultimately, it was a bachelor's of science. Um, right. Uh, with you know humanities, it was a humanities major, really. Okay. No, that's. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's good. With Human a specialty in feminism. <laughs> okay, that's, hey, that's, you know, it's, it's actually very uh, useful in today's world. So you understand the issues. Of course. Right. And then from there, you go to Ave Maria University, Catholic, Catholic? Catholic law school, yes. Actually, a uh, fun fact, it's the first law school to ever move from one state to another. So it was Really? Yes. Wow. It was originally in Michigan, and um, they moved to Naples. I mean, who... It's a no-brainer, right? You leave the snow, you want to come to the beach. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I was the inaugurating class of 2012. That's well, amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's not too far from Miami because I know. I shouldn't assume, but most Hispanic, Cuban Americans, they don't like to leave Miami for some reason. Well, it's beautiful here. It is know? beautiful. Why would you want to leave? <laughs> I, I hear you. And no, I mean, we have our whole, our whole communities here. We feel comfortable right, here. Right. We thrive here. So you know. It, it makes sense. So, yes. you know, and it's, you're able to go back, back, back and forth. 
Okay. So Versace Mansion, you yes. know, it's uh, it's an amazing place. You know, we talked uh, we talked off air about you know that time in in Miami, Miami Beach, and everything Versace did, and how inspiring he was, and how uplifting he was. And you know, I'm actually a fan uh, of true crime, like like we spoke. Yes. And so this is a, this is an interest of mine. And uh, going back to it's it's an amazing story, but at the same time, it's so sad because we lost. He really was, you know, an amazing, innovative fashion designer, and he brought a lot of life into Miami, you know. And I like his philosophy. His, his philosophy was like, it's better for for Versace to to lend a dress or whatever they wear, other well, not whatever, but other fashion attire to like a star like Madonna, right. than to sell it to a regular person because Madonna is going to show show it off in a show and then all the you know her fans are going to want to want to buy that that dress so he was really like uh, very strategic with the branding yes you know and then there's the aspect of true crime and law and this is where where you come in and you know to this day we don't know why andrew cunanan killed versace you know some speculate was it greed was it lust or maybe it was an insatiable appetite for fame. We, maybe it was a little bit of everything. <laughs> maybe it was a little bit of everything. We, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know. But um, so is going on a spree killing, is that linked to a particular, um, like I know you do personal injury. Is, is that considered technically like a wrongful death? Could, could it be considered wrongful well, death? Well, yeah, absolutely. It's an intentional tort. Um, there you go. Okay. It's an intentional tort. So, I mean, definitely, right. uh, anyone that intentionally commits murder, not only is there a criminal aspect of it, sure. but there is a civil aspect of it, which right. would be um, a wrongful death, a suit that could arise. Um, at, being that it's a tort, you would have to prove that there is a, a du duty breach causation and then, okay. of course, damages. We all have a duty to everyone that's around us, a, a duty of reasonable care. Right. And once you breach that duty by acting upon and causing then an injury, which in this case, a death, right. um, and damages do arise. And that, those damages could include things like you know, funeral expenses and right. burial expenses, loss of income that, that the death the, that the decedent mm -hmm. had yeah. <laughs> and supported his family. And um, loss of companionship. So yes, of course. Oh, that's right. Because uh, Versace had a a, com a companion, a, you know, and and what, siblings, and you yeah, know, right, family, right. surviving family. And and imagine the. I mean, seriously, imagine the damage. I mean, he was he was Johnny Versace. Right. Imagine the damage, the negative impact it has on on Versa on the brand, on the fashion brand. It was. Right. right. I don't want to say that he was the company. But I mean, he 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 was you know he was Versace. He was, he, the guy was something something else. You know? The harder part in this mm -hmm. scenario with Versace is how do you collect right uh, from this lawsuit? Because the person who right. murdered Versace was someone we could presume was insolvent, didn't have you know many assets. When you're looking at um, a, a, a typical lawsuit on how to recover, I mean, one of the more famous cases would then be O.J. Simpson, right? You know, they couldn't there you convict go. him. Right. There you go. Um, they couldn't. Com he was acquitted of murder. Right. See, because the burden of proof in a criminal case is a lot more. It's a lot harder. You know, you have to right. prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. And in a civil and in case, a civil case you, preponderance, preponderance yeah, right. of the evidence, right. it's more likely than not um, that oh. the, that it resulted in this person's death. And of course, O.J. Simpson acquitted that he didn't kill his wife, right? But then he was found liable, negligent for murder, for, for the death of his wife. He but was, he's he a was. person that you could definitely collect from. So right, because hey, he was. I, although he spent millions on his defense, I mean, he he, and that's another true crime story, which is which is amazing. Uh, the, right, the, right. The assassination. Uh, well, no, the O.J. Simpson trial, which is also American true, uh, crime stories. It has a whole episode. It's, it's an amazing. It's it's, a, it's an amazing. Yeah, it really episode. is. It really is. Well, yeah, going, you know, going back to Andrew Cunan, and I, I don't know, is, well, I, well, he ended up committing suicide, as we know, in the boathouse. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, could you make the argument, and I don't know that, I don't know that you can, that maybe, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to go there, but <laughs> was, was it like local government not, not providing enough security or policing or... But well, you can make any argument you want, right? That's why, <laughs> yeah. that's why we have lawyers, right? There you go, there you go. There you go. I mean, in order to be able to support that... I mean, would you make that argument or would you go a different angle? I mean, in order to be able to support that, you would have to um, prove that the police officers or the, you know, the government had a duty 
to protect in that particular instance, right? And that they didn't. So maybe they couldn't necessarily foresee. I mean, it's difficult. There is case law out there, actually. I was speaking about this earlier today. Right. Where, you know, there's sovereign immunity, um, that, that, that uh, sovereign immunity that protects government agencies from these particular situations, right? Okay. So. But, okay, so, and you brought up a great point. In this particular situation, um, so Andrew Cunanan, he did not start with Versace. He went on a spree killing, and I, he killed several people. Uh, I believe it started in Chicago with uh, property developer Lee Miglin. He killed him in a horrific way. The, docu the, 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 the documentary goes into it. And then he, he, he comes down, he, kills, he killed um, a naval officer. I'm sorry, I forget his name right now, which, which was his, his actual boyfriend. Uh, on the way down, he stops and he needs to switch cars and he goes into a small town and he kills just an innocent guy just to steal a car. And meanwhile, you have all these police reports, the FBI is involved and they're, you know, disseminating the information. Hey, we have this spree killer. That's the term that they use and, he, and they're looking for him. And yet, Miami did, and again, this is only for entertainment right, of and, course, of and educational purposes. I'm not really like, you know, I'm, you know, for educational purposes, yet did the, and I don't want to mention anything, did the local municipality do enough to prevent uh, or, or to, to capture um, Andrew Cunanan? And if you watch documentaries and if you watch a lot of the films, they all say, say the same thing. Well, the police really wasn't serious because it happened in the in the Miami Beach uh, gay community, and, right? And and, and and you weren't you weren't really protecting us because you don't care about us, and and that was that was a legit argument, and it comes up in documentaries. So, based on what we know, right? I mean, can there be a case, an effective or successful case? Well, I mean, we really have to dig into it more, right? I mean, did they do enough? Uh, that's that's the that's the the the, the winning question here. Right, but um, but they they. They saw that Andrew Cunanan actually went to a pawn shop, pawned something that he stole from Lee Miglin in Chicago, and gave him his ID with his real name. And, and there's a protocol for the police that you had to turn in. You all to this turn stuff. in, right, with the And it wasn't checked. And it wasn't checked. I'm just saying. I don't know. You're the lawyer. Possibly. I mean, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, again, you right. have to prove that right. the police officers had a duty of care to protect that particular you know, yeah. Versace in this particular instance. And how do we know that Versace was going to be next? I mean, it could have been anyone, right? It could have been so, anyone. We don't know that yeah, Versace exactly. was next, but we did know that Andrew Cunanan was making was his way down through. to that, And then there wasn't enough uh, dissemination of information. Only after Versace got killed, every, every you know, is Versace, the superstar, fashion superstar, uh, all hell breaks loose, if you will. Oh, and then, then they caught, you know, then the pressure was on and, and you know, I mean, it's an argument to be made, right? Um, do I think it's a strong one? Myself personally, probably not, right? <laughs> Considering the technology and things that we had and, and the way we were able to collect evidence back in the 90s. Right. Um, but hey, if, it may be worth looking into for someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, I don't believe there's a statute of limitation on that, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> when uh, it arises listen, from an is, actual intentional murder. <laughs> it's only for educational and entertainment purposes. I'm not, I'm not suggesting someone should go do that. You know, but I mean, it's an argument to be made. I mean, you can make both arguments. That maybe they did do enough, maybe they didn't do enough. Absolutely. You know? Um, so you're, you're a practicing attorney. Do you, what role does fashion play for you? Do you, I mean, I see you, you're dressing a very fat, you're fashionable, you. you're fashionable. You really are. I mean, do you, do you have a, a specific attire for going to court? Um, so being that I am a woman attorney, uh, and a young woman attorney in a man's world, really the law, it's still predominantly, um, dominated by men. Is it? Is it still is. There's it still no, is. There's no women in the Supreme Court? I mean, there are tons of women in the, I mean, there are women in the Supreme Court, oh, but yeah. there's more men obviously than women. Right. And they're still, <laughs> right. It's still even in the court when you go, there's still more men than women. Yeah. Um, is, I, is it your feminism training going on? Here? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I try to keep, and, and I'm young, I'm vibrant, right. you know, I'm uh, spicy. I try to keep my attire uh, that shows a little bit of my personality. Okay. Uh, I, and still, at the same time, stay uh, conservative enough. You know, I course, try to stay away from the right. grays, you know, the gray suits and, and uh, the grays, the blacks, the, the dark blues. Oh, and, wow. 
you know, he's bringing a little bit more of my personality. I hear you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on Business World. It's been a pleasure, and I hope you can come back and speak about other interesting topics. Likewise, it'll be my pleasure. Awesome. Friends, thank you for watching MDC TV. We'll be right back. Hello, Sharks. I am Finn. Do you know that there is a new requirement for graduation? Most students must now meet the Florida Civic Literacy Exam requirement. The test has 80 questions, and you must get at least 60% right to pass. The good news is that MDC has set up a Florida Civic Literacy Exam Learning Resources site with all the information you need. Scan this QR code to get started. Don't wait. Get FCLE graduation ready today. Friends, welcome back to Business World. And we continue our discussion on the Versace mansion and fashion. And again, no one could have ever anticipated the actions of Andrew Cunanan when he murdered Johnny Versace. Was it greed? Was it lust? Or maybe an insatiable appetite for fame? Joining us today is Professor Richard Tapia, a Professor of Political Science and International Relations here at Miami Dade College. Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me once again. It's always a pleasure to be here on Business World. You're always welcome. Professor, can you tell us a little bit about the economic impact of the fashion industry here in uh, South Florida and specifically in Miami Beach? Yes, so to understand the context of fashion, of the film industry here in Miami, one has to understand the overall strategy for economic development here in Miami. Since the end of the Civil War, the southern states, Florida in particular, the strategy has been revolving around two major industries, right? And this goes all the way back to the bourbon governors. It's tourism right. and agriculture. So the idea is build railroads. And in, case, in the case of Miami, going back to 1896, it was Henry Flagler who built the Florida East Coast Railroad. And the idea was bring tourists in and oranges out because of the climate and the type of soil that Florida had. But the problem was that in Miami and in Florida, we were over-dependent, and we continue to be in many ways a bit over-dependent on tourism. The 1926 hurricane had a devastating effect in Miami, and Miami kind of went into the cycle of boom and bust based on tourism and real estate development and so forth. You saw this in the 1950s, you saw it in the 80s, and then you saw it in the 90s. Now, in the 80s and 90s, you're going to see with governors such as Bob Graham and others, there's been a strategy of how do we diversify Miami's economy. And what they look at is not just the neoclassical model of economic development by creating tax incentives, but you also have to have targeted industries. You have to do cluster analysis. You have to basically say, what is our base? We know tourism is our base. We know agriculture is our base. But what other industries have support industries or clusters that can grow? And what we saw here in Miami, it tended to be international trade, it tended to be banking, it tended to be the plastic industries. And then, long and behold, the film and fashion industry became areas in which we were able to attract people from all over the world to come here. And a lot of that had to do with some of the strategy of developing Miami Beach, South Beach in particular, by the mid 80s and early 90s, that was well planned out. And it was successful in bringing people like Versace, bringing not just the fashionistas, but the film industry. And in Miami, with tax incentives, because we had supporting industries here, not only did we develop fashion and film, but we also developed, let's say, TV production. We developed Univision being headquartered here, Telemundo. We, and with that, with the actors, with the critical mass, you're then able to bring artists, models, and in doing so, you create Miami as the destination here in the United States to right. visit. To put it in perspective, when UBS did a study of the most visited places in the United States, New York was number one, Miami was number two. And in having the fashion and film industry, we diversified Miami in such a way that we brought back the glamour to Miami. In the 1980s, after Marielle, there was this real question with the crime wave that had taken place mm -hmm. in Miami, has Miami become paradise lost, which was the, the big cover right. on Time Magazine. I remember, yeah. And so the response was, what can we do? 
to diversify Miami's economy? How do we take care of crime? Because part of the consequence of being successful, of great economic development, is over-tourism. And you see this not just in Miami, but you see this in Europe, you see this in Rome, you see this all over the world. Right. And so you see it here in Miami with the spring breakers yeah. and the fact that Miami Beach, just like Fort Lauderdale and Daytona did before them, has had to pass a lot of laws and restrictions trying to get kind of like, let's say, the spring breakers that are the ones that really don't want to abide by any rule of law and are committing massive amounts of crime. Last spring break, there was over 500 arrests. There were multiple shootings. Already this spring break, we had one shooting and we have multiple arrests, despite the measures of trying to crack down on some of these, some of the rowdiest of people. But you kind of have to pick your poison because if you're too strict, you basically undo right. all of the efforts of economic development. But if you're not, the crime basically undoes your efforts as yeah. well. And, and sometimes you have to break up with people. And that's what's, happening. That's what's happening in Miami Beach. Sometimes that's relationships it. are toxic. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Let's transition because I think, um, you know, I think really when, when we look at it, Johnny Versace really initiated a lot of the stuff, right? It wasn't government-led. It wasn't economic uh, development policies that did this. But Johnny Versace was instrumental because his approach, he was such an innovator in, in this fashion industry, right? His approach was, listen, it's better to sell his uh, dresses or his clothing to, instead, it's, instead of selling it to, to a regular person, it's better to lend it to, a, to Madonna, to, to a star. And they wear his products and then in return it has, it's the it's like he like invented influencers before there were influencers. And then as, as a result, everyone wants to wear that brand. Um, you know, they have, they have their shows. Everyone wants to come to, to Miami Beach and, and see, the, to see the mansion. And it's, it's just, he's just, he was just that type of influential, uh, I guess you can call him an artist. Right. And, and, and it, Malcolm. And Mal it's, it's organically done. It, it, was, it wasn't uh, led by Malcolm government. Malcolm Gladwell talks about that very point that you're making in the tipping point, where, and he talks about it with the penny loafers in Greenwich Village in New York City, right. that when you had certain influencers, as you would refer to them, wearing it or certain people that are popular, more people begin to see it, and that moves the population. And what I want you to understand, when you have economic development, you bring up a, a good point. It's not just government. It's not just the artists. It tends to be a confluence of factors that come together, a critical mass working together that brings about economic development within South Beach. It was government with tax incentives, but it was also developers coming to redevelop some of the older hotels and renovating them and restoring their, their true character, which is the Art Deco style of the 1920s and 30s of Miami Beach. It was the artists coming in, getting famous let's say not just the fashionistas and the designers, but the artists also wearing and highlighting Miami, wearing the merchandise and highlighting Miami as the place to be. And you see this developing not just in South Beach, but you see it taking place in Buena Vista in the design district, later in Wynwood, and you're beginning to see it today in Little Haiti. And so with that critical mass of government providing tax incentives, developers coming in, places like Miami Day College offering the film and TV production degrees or offering degrees in design or today AI that basically support these industries right. that allows for this critical mass to take place. So you're right, it's not just government. In a free market like we have here where we have a mixed economy, it tends to be the private sector, it tends to be government working right. together, it tends to be individuals and right. designers and that's coming good, into the area. That's a good point and, and I think uh, it's important to note that historically there has always been, right, uh, confluence, a uh, symbiotic relationship between art and power. And this right. is highlighted in, you know, Florence, Italy with the Medici. Medici. And, you know, during that time, the, the Renaissance really was a competition for power expressed through art, right? right. And it was a Cosimo I, along with his, his um, manager, administrator, Bazzari, you know, basically what they did was a they wrote a book to explain what this Renaissance era was, its competition of power expressed through art, this patronage of art. And in the book, he argued that the world had been dark for a thousand years until the light of the artist illuminated it. 
right? And this book became, you know, the, the rebirth, and that set the, the, the era that we know as the Renaissance. And there's always been that, you know, so I, and I wanted to mention that because, and I don't want to transition into negative stuff, but a lot of regimes will bring artists over to other countries and say, well, no, no, we're just artists. We don't have anything to do with politics. Historically, that's not factual, right? Let's transition to the negative side of this because anytime there's a celebrity, you know, obviously a lot of good things happen, but then there's a lot of uh, people that become obsessed, uh, which is the case of Andrew Cunanan. And, you know, we still, it's still really unknown why he committed, he went on a, on a, on a spree killing, right? And a lot of people speculate, was it greed? You know, was it lust? Or maybe an insatiable appetite for fame. It's still unknown, right? What, what uh, uh, things or what safety nets can, can we put uh, government, local government, to stop these, uh, I guess these will be wrongful deaths or well, sp spreading keys? And, and this is becoming more of an issue. Well, what, what spring, what's happening now with spring break mm -hmm. and what the city of Miami Beach and Fort Lauderdale and Daytona has done right. in the past is raise parking fees, create curfews, kind of create a lot of restrictions. But one has to be careful that with the poison they pick, right? Yeah. You want tourism, right? but you want tourism that's responsible. You want tourism that doesn't become a public nuisance. So right. with having provisions like what Miami Beach has recently enacted, not just with curfews, but putting parking fees at $100, yeah. raising not just parking fees, but other types of fees, banning, let's say, certain beverages on the beach and so forth. All of that had the effect in Fort Lauderdale and Daytona of turning it into a ghost town. But there are certain restrictions that you could, you could basically pass. You could pass sensible solutions such right. as, let's say, different types of gun control type provisions that don't infringe on people's Second Amendment rights, but at the same time are reasonable. They're reasonable to basically create certain types of restrictions to make things more peaceful for law enforcement, such as waiting periods, such as bump stocks and so forth. There are other types of reasonable things that you could do using AI right. that basically you're able to identify, you know, who has, let's say, who has a felony warrant out right. for their arrest. And today with AI and let's say facial mm -hmm. recognition, there's a lot of tools that law enforcement can have so that you don't have to kill the tourism industry, but at the same time, you could try to bring down, bring down crime. In the that case of sensible. Andrew, Coo yeah, in the in the case of Andrew Cunanan, we had a, a situation with the serial killer. We don't know what the trigger was, but he went into a series of spree killings, killing, yeah, spree killing. a spree killing that took place, and eventually, he he was it culminated he was with, with Johnny Versace. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you yeah. very much. These are all sensible uh, solutions. Thank you, friends. Thank you for watching Business World. Until next time, we'll see you then.